traveled. Um, and uh, one of the last things I did there is a long story is ended up putting together the deal between Mattel and JPL to do the Mattel Mars rovers, which spawned a whole bunch of other similar deals. And then NASA decided it wasn't something they wanted to do, so I spun it out to a company, did that uh, for a while, and got tired of running a company which had a lot of stuff with it, and uh, was uh, asked to uh, start working at National University. And National is uh, the largest single institution preparer of teachers for credentialing in California, so we have a very large uh, population of teachers. We also have a very large population of alumni. Um, we're also, I think, either the first or second biggest grantor of master's degrees in education to minorities. And so we have a very big population. We have a, you know, a very deep pool. And, and so my job is, among other things, is to come up with ways to uh, teach these people math and science better. And in particular, to form relationships with research institutions. Because we don't do any research the way it, the aerospace people mean it. Um, we, we have some research, educational research and effectiveness and assessment and things like that, but we're very good at it. But, you know, I've been frustrated because, you know, I come out of JPL, and so I know about what I call uh, coloring book outreach, right? There's nothing wrong with putting out coloring books that have pictures of a mission in it, but people stop it, you know, and that's it, you know, or they put out glossy websites, and that's good, but people can't get involved in that. There's sort of no way for people to actually have an active role or, um, in the science that's going on. And so what we've been trying to do is I've been approaching a lot of places and said, well, suppose you're a scientist and you have too much data. And suppose you have uh, not enough people to analyze your data. Or it's data that sort of has no real time limit on it. Like um, the example I always use is National Geographic has a project where um, they're looking for Kublai Khan's tomb. They have a bunch of aerial imagery. And they have a little video that explains to you what a sand dune looks like and what a man-made structure looks like and all this other stuff. And then you go look at as much imagery as you can stand and you label things that might be Kublai Khan's tomb. And whoever finds it, that's going to be a very, very cool thing, right? So it seems to me that some crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing or citizen science or whatever you like, and the problem is that most of the most people who are doing research have a data set, um, have software that is aimed for their grad students, or for 12 people, or for science team, or for people who are PhDs. They're not really, they don't really have a piece of their data set walled off so that the general public, or in my case, you know, my undergraduate, could go work on it. And clearly, there, those problems exist. And the trick is to find them. So, so, you know, my mission at the moment is to find people who are doing interesting science that would lend itself to having some pieces split off that an undergraduate who has maybe algebra, maybe if we're really lucky calculus, but probably not, could in a couple of weeks do a real research project because our students are largely online um, in the program that I'm in. They, I can give them instructions to go do a lab. Will they do it? Maybe. Will they do it like this, very cautiously? Probably. You know. The students you're referring to are all education students. Education students. So there's a lot of leverage. Undergraduate education students. They can go into the classroom and you know and convey the excitement they hopefully learn as part of the program. Or keep working on the same project. So the idea is, is can we come up with you know multi-year, very long-term? I mean, a lot of these space data analysis things go on for years, right? So can we come up with a couple of hypotheses that will take a long time to test that lend themselves to being cut into little pieces um, and that then, you know, we can form a very long-term relationship between National and our students. We also have a professional development arm that works with a lot of teachers. And if you actually give a teacher a little bit of a research project to do, they get a lot more excited and they, they see right away what they can do with it. Because okay. they, they're wildly overburdened. Um, they have too much to do. They're afraid of math and science a lot of them. And so they're afraid to do a classroom demo unless they're really sure it'll work. But if you have something online and they work with it in the class, then when they go student teach, they can keep doing it. The idea is to form these relationships with some major science data providers that can last for years. Kind of a general comment. One of the things, um, I, I also used to work at the General Bush 
laboratory. And one of the things they had is they had these free packets that they would give to teachers, educators, and posters and pictures and this kind of stuff. And I would tell people who were student teachers, and they would say, oh, I'll tell the science teacher. And I was always very frustrated. It's like, well, why does this have to be just the science teacher who is interested in this? Why isn't the history teacher and the English teacher? And it's like, why have they compartmentalized it? And then your comment just now about you know, finding a tomb. It's like, well, there's history. There's the history teacher saying, you know, this is the technology we're using to, to do history or the anth anthropology or, or, you know, whatever. It's like, this, it's not just the science teachers. It's, it's, you know, this technology is now, it cuts across. Just so for entertainment, so who is, who are you all? Um, I'm actually a software engineer, but my mom's a retired teacher, and you know, I've always been into science. Um, you know, I, I just got a little more like engineering as, as time went on. Uh, but yeah, uh, I you know I only tell this about myself and uh, the, the member of the astronomy group. We sometimes do outreach to local elementary schools, and I, I mean to be bluntly honest about it, I mean the state of you know scientific knowledge and literacy is, is minimal. I mean it's not just from the kids, but from the parents as well. So like. I remember last time I did an outreach, I was uh, showing Jupiter to a telescope. People were asking, well, is that the moon? I mean, honestly, not joking, they were asking. You know, and, and I don't, uh, you know, I say, no, that, that's Jupiter. They're asking, you know, what, you know, can see during the day, all these basic questions. And I, I asked them all, you know, there needs to be a lot more effort at getting people interested in science at an early age. And then I guess we're going to after we do introductions. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And he's my husband, he asked me here, but, you know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, I'm the strong <laughs> so you're still, you're still a former, former current. Yeah, well, that's such an awesome And so, uh, great t-shirt, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's on me. Show it for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom, currently. I have a three-year-old daughter that I hope to teach as much as I possibly can about space. And, um, most likely we'll do public school with her, um, depending on where we live <laughs> and what public school looks like in three years. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of personally, in my journey of space knowledge, regret not not being pushed a little further in, in the math science, but, but also just being taught how to incorporate it all, you know, I mean, Again, history is also now, you know, like it, it, it doesn't have to all be, you know, a, a scientific study of everything. We can look at, you know, what what were the humans thinking as they did this? Like, what, what was the more sociology, psychology, it can all be. If you put a little bit of history behind that kind, people understand it better because if you put them in the frame of mind that of whoever discovered it, you know, I mean, I've been teaching graphing by talking about Descartes what his problem was because, you know, he invented Cartesian coordinates, right? You know what I mean? Nobody had XY coordinates before him and he had a problem, he had to solve it, he made it up, right? And so if you present the problem and they say, oh, well, yeah, okay, I get there. And they say, okay, well, the brightest guy in 1610 figured that out, so you're up to him now, you know, and then he's sort of walking forward. Before that, Before that, figure out because, you know, well, you're talking about people inventing algebra, and people initially look at you like you have 27 heads because they think it came up from hell on a tablet or something, right? <laughs> you know, well, most are convinced it did come from hell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or Lord, maybe. Dante in her circle. At least calculus. You know, yeah. and um, you know, so if you, if they see that, like a person who had faults, I always look up the faults of these, you know, 1620 persons, like their weird habits and things. Because uh, this person who was sort of a weirdo about this, and then, you know, he could just kind of, well, you know, but he did this, right? Um, Newton's a real interesting guy, too. You know, they like the idea that Stephen Hawking has Newton's chair in him. He didn't know that. So, I'm blithering, though, so we didn't. So. Sorry. Um, well, what you're getting at is actually sort of, I was trying to figure out why. By um, which is that basically I'm a filmmaker um, and I'm interested in obviously in space and science and such. Um, and for some reason, over the last five, six years, I've become more and more interested in developing educational tools, software, um, and largely from a storytelling kind of a standpoint. And so, what, what you were saying about trying to anchor some of these things in, in stories, I think people learn things. From for some reason, through a lot of times through stories and through music, these are things that just kind of help clue you in on a different levels, like different learning modalities people talk about, and and 
I don't know which one, you know, kinesthetic or which one it is exactly the stories fit into, but but somewhere in there, um, it's real. It's a real powerful thing, and I'm I'm very much interested in immersive software simulations. There's like uh, there's a thing that you're probably aware of called Jason. Are you familiar with that? The Jason Project. I used to work for this, this documentary. The space, the space Jason, or the no, the so what they, did, they did like they, they would take like kids. They would take a bunch of kids to to an event, uh, school kids to an event, and they would get to share on these giant screens and be sort of in real time while these people were exploring like volcanoes and something in Hawaii and all these other exotic places. So it was like a way, it was sort of like like a younger version of the science data set that you're talking about. But they were like exposed kids to real science going on in, in real time, basically. And so all that kind of stuff fascinates me. I want to find a way to get involved in it. And there's, and there's presence. You know, I mean, this whole ability to be virtually present cheaply. You yeah, know, I mean, and that's, that's becoming deal. really doable, by the way. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of, I mean, you know, the very simplest version of that is Skype. But I got a lot of ideas about how to make that better. So I would love to like, talk to some other Google Plus versions. Hangouts now is also. Sorry? Google Plus Hangouts. I heard someone else mention that. I don't know why I'm not aware of it. Well, Google <laughs> Plus is Google's new social network. It's currently invite only, but it'll be open to the public supposedly soon. But it, it, basically, it's free group video chat. So in Skype, uh, you have to pay money to do like the group chats. But right. so people are, you know, mostly it's just hanging out. But some people are doing like um, yeah, collaborative painting or uh, music or uh, teaching. Oh. Some guys doing collaborative uh, software coding. So, huh. All right, well, that's good. Things, so. Our direction. Yeah. so I was suggesting some of the NASA missions can have like hangouts, you know, rather than like just yeah. you know, this week in NASA, it could be like a hangout, you ask questions. Well, hang out with the see. folks in, at the station right now. Would that mean you, you could do that, that yeah, if there's no bandwidth for that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all managing scale, you know, so I mean, a lot of these things are so onesie twosie, you know, yeah. so the question that, you know, we've been wrestling with is, is, you know, my boss has said, how do you figure out how some of these things scale? You know, right. So we have a lot of our alumni out there that want to tie into this somehow. You know, how could we, how could we do that? What about you, sir? Oh, uh, I'm in Luis Camacho. I'm a mechanical engineer in Mexico. Okay. I've been in the textile industry for 20 years, and right now I, w I work on my credential for teaching physics and uh -huh. earth science. Here or in Mexico? Yes. Here. Okay. Cool. Okay. So you'd be one of my customers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it's a, it's a struggle because I think. You know, scientists aren't really rewarded for doing this, you know, and so, except so, sort of psychologically, but you know, I mean, there's a lot of lip service, but, you know, and there are people who are sincerely interested and who cross the line and try to make it go, but it's, you know, you have to really find those people, you know, you have to hunt around and find those people. Most scientists view it as a chore of people doing big space projects, you know, one or two percent of this is to get dedicated to to outreach, and it's something you have to do, and some people really throw their energy into it, but a lot don't. You know, part of the trouble is that certainly, it's true in academia as well, it's not valued as much as it should be, and somehow we want to change the mindset. But it's, you know, there's three pieces to it. There's the scientists with the problem and the data. There's creating an interface to whatever they use to analyze their data that a normal person can understand, and that will work over the web and all those other things. And then there's, you know, the, the side of have these teachers and how do you help them hook into this and how do you make it attractive and how do you scale it and oh, by the way how do you run it? Well, well I think it runs into uh, just the general approach to like what science is. I mean I think most people think that you know science is just like memorizing like these list of facts and that, that's what it is. But you know science is a process of discovery and um, even at the high school level it really isn't instilled in the people these days. Like you know they say like the earth is 93 million miles away and you're expected to just believe it rather than understand why. And actually, the, there was a guy at the math prof at UCLA named Terrence Howe. He gave a, a speech or a talk called the Cosmic Distance Ladder, where he explained how we know like how far away the moon is, how far away the Earth is from the sun, how big the sun is, uh, using just a little bit of tricks. So basically, something that like junior high school or high school level could do. And you know, it took you didn't have to take anything on you know faith or credit. It was just all explained by things that you can observe. And you know, teaching it from that perspective, I think, from early on, will get people to push in the process more. Yeah, so it's it's a yeah. You know, so you have to have a but the, a lot of it too is the story around it. Like this um, National Geographic example I was talking, telling you about finding Khan's tomb. They have a whole bunch of stuff on that website about who Khan was and who the explorers are, and you know, so they've been very very good at that. And obviously, their National Geographic, so the entertainment value stuff is really high. Um, but there's also a website called Fold It. It's fold.it, I guess it's in Italy just because it's convenient. 
and fold it. Um, it's a funny story, and I'll probably get parts of it wrong, but it's a good example. Um, there are a whole bunch of people who do protein folding, and that's a thing that's like a puzzle, right? And it's a, I, you know, so it's a three-dimensional thing. You want to figure out how these proteins fold. And so um, there were these bunch of protein chemists who put up a website with a whole bunch of different data, to, and the, the idea was that you would play with this data online in some symbolic way. Um, it's sort of a, a loose three-dimensional representation. Figure out how the thing folded, and then the one person who folded the most of them and did the best job would get a free trip to the next conference of protein chemists or something. They figured we all postdocs, right? So this one person just cleaned up, you know, just did a fantastic number of these things, and they had, you know, some stuff about protein <coughs> and everything. And so the organizer sent them a note that said, "Well, great, you know, um, you know, you're going to the National Society of Protein Chemists or whatever the organization was." And he said, well, um, I have this problem. Is Can my mom come too? Because I'm 13. <laughs> and then they checked all the highest ranked ones, and they were all like tweens. They were like 13, 14, 15-year-olds. So there were all these 13, 14, 15-year-olds folding proteins. And we knew a little bit about what was going on, but it was a video game for them. And apparently a very good and very entertaining and very engaging video game because this person has spent an incredible amount of time working. It always on it. works. <laughs> and so, you know, so you think about that and you say, wow, you know, that's an example, right? And so they've let, they've rethought it a little bit and left it up. And I guess, I don't know what the, they sent them to Disneyland instead of what, but, you know, they did something for him. And um, sent his mom too, I assume. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know the end of the story. <laughs> but, but anyway, so basically the bottom line is, you know, that's a successful example because it's a sophisticated data set. It did some actual good. Um, I think people get more engaged if they're actually doing some good and they're actually tying into a scientist who's doing good work and doing that, because they don't think it's possible. You know? Scientists don't regard it as a chore because they're actually, it's actually helping their research. It's doing some so good, and so it incentivizes it. You know, so I've been talking to some earth science people about how do we do this. It's sort of a funny hole, though, that you know, there's no obvious funding source. Because the the scientists are funded to do their thing, and they're funded to do some data analysis, and they're doing that. It's too far from entertainment to get entertainment funding. Typical standard normal entertaining fun entertainment funding. So you're sort of left with philanthropy, you know, or course development, trying to do to glue together things on the side of you know getting paid for developing a college course, which you know, I am anyway. So, but the software is a little sophisticated. So it's a funny it's a funny niche. And I haven't figured out, you know, I, you know, I think there's an entertainment product here if people are open-minded. Well, one but product, you just said it, is, is software. There, you know, if, if there were an iPad app, just as an example, you know, that, 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 that you could bring into the classroom that would allow you to tap into these data sets you want, there's a market. I can sell, to, I can sell a zillion of those to, to teachers, you know, all over the world, that, you know, so... So, I mean, so you see that it, that's a big development app. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that that's so, the yes. solution. I'm just right. saying that, that, that that's one model is right. to sell it to education in, in a way that, like you said, it has to be scalable and, and it has to be fit into budgets so, and it has to be modular and it has to be vetted by a million people. That's going to be one of the problems. But, but um, you know, there's a market. I mean, you know, there, there's... It's there. It's just, you know, how do you get the first one and convince the first two or three scientists to work on this that... It's not trivializing what they're doing. I mean, when I, I don't know when any of you were here when I gave my little spiel at the beginning, but one of the things I did, I was at JPL and I was in the tech transfer office and put together the Mattel Mars rover deal. And there were a lot of people very negative about that because it was seen as trivializing the space program. And so sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, if I'm going to get a bunch of people who are going to teach third grade involved in my research, you know, my colleagues are going to snort at me. So, so you have to kind of overcome that. So you have to find the right people. So I'm, I'm kind of wandering around, you know, holding up the light over my head, saying, "So, are you the, are you the right, are you the right person?" You know, <laughs> and just see if we can find that, that person who has a data set. So I, there's a couple, but you know, we really, it's, it's a real, you know, and there's so many people who say, "I have all this data and I have nobody to analyze it, and it's all rotting on the shelf, and I don't have enough grad students," because people tend science tends to get funded to take data but not to analyze it. You know, I mean, that's just how life didn't, works. Didn't they do, I didn't actually try it, but for the Stardust mission, didn't they have some sort of on online component where people could try to look for particles because it had, the Stardust mission had captured a bunch of, you know, they had used that aerogel stuff and they were supposed to capture particles 
but then it was needle in the haystack. How do we find it? Yeah. I mean, is there? Can you make so, a Is it something we can make a game of? Like you're talking about the folding proteins. I don't know if there's any benefit to turning folding proteins into some a video game or an iPhone app game or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it sort of already is. I mean, that's what yeah, that's yeah. they use. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, there's so a big difference between getting the raw data and making these apps. So a lot of times these groups are not going to have time to make an engaging right. application to go through the data, but. It gives them make the raw data available, but then only people who are trained are going to really use it. You know, but I would be interested big, in the raw data for a while. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge, um, you know, if it's a, and also, you know, in my case, my classes are a month long. We, we, our, our students take one class intensively, and so, the undergraduates, and they, um, so I have a month to work with. And so what I'm supposed to do is to come up with some interdisciplinary, hands-on, lab-oriented, online classes that will excite people who are, you know, who right now are, are not terribly science comfortable, mostly. Some of them are, but mostly not. And so, you know, that's my requirements to, to speak engineer speak, right? And so you say, okay. And oh, by the way, go find some scientists to provide the data and be in a long-term relationship with us and all this kind of stuff. And so then that's where you start calling all your friends and seeing which ones call you back. <laughs> So, so, so like that's if there your, were a clearing house, there ought to be like a clearing house or something, somebody in between you and the scientific community who could kind of like. Well, we could even, I mean, we could, you know, we could be that clearing house because, you know, we have this thing called the National University Community Research Institute. And so the idea is that we could support a clearing house like that. But you have to get the, you have to get the first people in the door to be the co eyes on the proposals. You know, because I can sit there all day long, but if I don't actually have the science collaborator, you know, everybody says, well, what's your pilot? So I've been trying to to find my to find my co-pilot, if you like, you know, to get some pilots and get some of that, prove it out. So you can say like um, one of the Mars programs has something called Click Workers, which isn't dissimilar either. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we could. I've been talking to the to one of the scientists on one of the Mars teams about well, you should go talk to the Click Workers people. So I need to do that. So it's out there, piecemeal. Mm -hmm. Cornell has um, something called um, Christmas Day Birding. And at all across the world on Christmas Day, people oh, yes, go out and count birds. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, so it, so it, you only do it. It has the beauty that you just do it once. So it's a you know, it's a day that you've sat and eaten too much anyway. So you go out and count birds, right? It's sort of a good thing to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not working that day. It's brilliant, really. And so people count birds once a year, and then the scientists have all that data to work with, you know. But it's you know, it's a it's a tough um, it's a tough sell. So if, you know, if any of you are have things, you know, find me, find me later, think about that. I think we're going to, we're coming up on 4.30, huh? Yeah, so, you know, so do that. And if you haven't seen the solar telescope, it's really good. You know, oh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to, you know, chat in the hall, I guess we're going to get kicked out of here by the next week. But, um, you know, if you have ideas or things or stuff. Uh, any the next group is also science outreach, right? So is it? Yes, it is. Okay. So maybe it's maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's a day. It's yeah, I'm playing just to just stay. Yeah, popularizing science. Who is the most? Marinette. Oh, okay. Maybe she opened the door so you feel like you can come in, mm -hmm. and we'll just flow right into that. Maybe. <laughs> same, same issues. You know. Very similar. Yes. You know. Should have the chairs. Should have the chairs. Well, we can just roll. We can pull out. We just pull in. We can pull out. We make a bigger group. It was a bigger group. Can you get a little closer? There's a line for someone else. Where do you do? We're at National University.